So I want to introduce Paul Bride. And Paul Bride, I call him a unicorn, and he truly is. Uh, I feel so fortunate to have Paul as, a, as, my, as the photographer for all of Kuyu's images. You know, building a company, it, it takes a lot of luck and stars aligning and meeting the right people at the right times. I had worked with another photographer when we first started this business that ended up letting go because it just wasn't the right fit. The hunts were too tough for him. And after I, I let Daniel go, I was like, how am I gonna find somebody that can grind on a sheep hunt and capture images of what we do? Because I didn't want to do stage photography for ads or a website. I wanted authentic, real sheep hunts, photography of those to represent really who we are as a brand, tell our story, and, the, and show off these amazing places that we go. And I just so happened to be catching a flight from Salt Lake back to Sacramento. It's like two weeks after I let my photographer go. Paul was late getting on the plane, happened to sit down next to me, and he put this low pro bag over the overhead compartment. He sat down next to me and said, uh, hobby or do you shoot professionally? He goes, no, I shoot professionally. I'm heading down to Yosemite to go shoot a couple of Arcteryx athletes on Half Dome. And I was like, what are you doing for the rest of your life? <laughs> And then, would you consider shooting a hunting trip? You know, the outdoor, a lot of the people in the outdoor are anti-hunting. And Paul's like, told him, kind of explained to him the flight, the things, the places I go and the ventures I go on and what we're trying to capture with photography. He's like, you know what, I might do that. So he gave me his card. And this is early days of Kuyu. Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, bootstrapping. Cash is tight. And Paul did me a huge favor. and gave me some ridiculous daily rate that well below what he normally charged just to help me out. And I took him to Arctic Red, was his very first experience hunting. And that trip, just the way it worked out, was an 11-day marathon. We killed a sheep on the very last day. Yep. But we also killed a mountain caribou and a wolf. We had to pack it all out. Um, and what I figured out from Paul, the harder the hunt gets, the worth, worse the conditions get, I'll look over at Paul, he's like, this is awesome. I'm like, this is miserable. It, it'd be miserable for me thinking about being there just capturing photography, not with a tag in my pocket. Um, it's, been, it's, it's tough to find somebody like that, and it's tough to find somebody with Paul's eye and skill set. He's the most uh, awarded, recognized outdoor photographer in the world. He's won more awards. He shot more cover <laughs> shots for climbing <laughs> magazines and publications in the world. So fortunate to have Paul capture what we do. Thank you. And Thank you. he's one of the greatest people on earth. And so I'm excited to have him talk about photography because there's nobody better in the business. Thanks, brother. Yep. Thank you, brother. Okay. Well, on that, that, that note, uh, thank you, Jason, for having me down. I really appreciate QU. Thank you, QU. Um, all right. And welcome to QU Mountain Academy Photography Tips. A little bit about myself. My name is Paul Bride. I've been working in the outdoor industry. Um, climbing, skiing, um, kayaking, and uh, for close to 20 years, and with Jason hunting for, uh, this is our seventh year now. Um, so I'm not a hunter. I don't have a background in hunting. Um, you don't want to get any uh, gun skills from me. That's definitely for sure. But um, I do know how camera works, and um, I know how to take pictures in bad hostile locations. So that being said, we're going to talk a little bit about documentary style photography and hopefully you guys will get a couple tips on making your photos better. So we're just going to work on here and okay, documentary style photography or photojournalism, what is it? It's not rocket science, you guys, anybody, anybody? Sorry? Yeah, capturing the shot. What we're, what, we're, what we're doing is we're telling a story with our cameras. We're not writers or I'm not anyways. I've had editors tell me it's a good thing that my photos are good. Your story's terrible. <laughs> um, so, in that regard, yeah, um, you know, some people bring a pen, or they got their computer, they bring a camera. And following around professional athletes, professional hunters, these guys are athletes, like they're fit, right? So definitely being fit is part of the job. Um, gear. 
I've had the opportunities of wearing, you know, Arcteryx, wearing Patagonia, North Face gear. QU gear is the bomb. Uh, thank you, Jason. Yeah, really, thank you, thank you so much. I love the gear. Like, the, I first showed up with Jason and I was wearing Arcteryx gear, my first hunt. And you know, we had a lot of rain, you know, but um, I'm there in my bright blue jacket, my red boots on, like, well, I'm coming from the climbing world. And... Uh, I guess it was pretty funny for these guys are going like, dude, you stick out like a sore thumb. I mean, you're an idiot. But as we got more into the hunt, I really started to enjoy it and settled into documenting what they're doing. That's what we're here to do. We're not here to, these guys, they talk, they, they, they glass. You're observing. You want to take better photos. And if you're planning on doing it, maybe you may want to make a career out of it, or if you just want to take better photos, you know, just for your family and your friends, remove yourself from the situation. It really helps. You just, you're just observing. Um, step back, drop 100 yards back, walk 100 yards forward, um, and you get a completely different perspective of what's going on. That being said, sometimes you need to be close with them and you're using wider angle lenses, but people don't react well when there's a camera right in your face. You get used to it um, as, you know, the, the more that it happens, but if you're just with friends, family, they don't like it. They're going to back up. The, it's really going to show in the photographs. So choosing our lenses is a really big part of photography, obviously, but before we even get there, we're going to just take a step back and we're going to talk about one of the steps. And we need to change our thought process from taking photographs to taking images. That might sound a little weird, but there's a difference between a photograph and an image. A photograph is what we take on the weekend, you know, just, just, just click, you know, or out of your car, or, you know, you're just taking, taking a picture to, to, to grab something. An image, on the other hand, has a thought process. Okay, and we start off, and it's a visual idea that we have in our head. So even before I leave for a trip, where are we going? We're going to Alaska, you know, we're going to, we're going to Mexico, we're going to New Zealand. What are we hunting? I want to find out as much information about the area as possible. It's really important to do that because once you know where you're going, you can start to create images in your head. You're not just on the fly. Because we don't want to shoot a lot. Shooting a lot is, a, is become sort of mainstream. And shooting a lot means when you get home, you're going to be doing a lot of work. You don't want to do a lot of work when you get home because you just finished a two-week trip, right? So our visual idea that, that we have in our head, you can talk about it, you know, with friends. Like, I want to get a shot of you doing this. You know, it's really important. You know, like, you got this new gear on. You got this new, did this new rifle. You're in this, in this cool situation. Come up with some ideas in your head, and now we're going to try to put it onto our camera. So it, the second step of the phase is the imaginative process. And once you arrive your, to your location, you need to start somewhere to shoot. So how does it start? Does it start on the plane? Does it start when we arrive and we're hanging out in a hangar? Once you remove yourself from the situation of who you're hanging out with, you're going to have a completely new perspective. The third and final step of taking an image is pressing the shutter button. Most people click, 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 and we all know a little bit about photography, and we've all taken a lot of pictures. Click, 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 click doesn't work if you want to take images. Images are the thought process, and then the creative process, like, and finally pressing the shutter button. That makes sense? Yeah, a little bit? Okay, <laughs> thanks. So when, now that we've got our idea, and we know that we don't want to just hammer on the shutter button. We need to start somewhere when we look through our viewfinder. Okay, this might be a little boring, but we're going to get to something more exciting, guys. I promise. So this is the way. I mean, you guys, maybe a lot of you already know this. Or you've heard of it. The rule of thirds. This is how we see through our lens, through our viewfinder. Sorry. Um, it's divided up into segments. The middle section in general being the most boring part of a photograph. We don't want to center images. That being said, if we fill the screen, you know, it, it's just a rule, just somewhere, somewhere to begin. When we fill the sides of our image, it's actually 
a more desirable image for us to look at. Okay, we see left to right, that's the way that our brains are taught, because we read left to right, right? So, that being said, movement can be shown through images, and the image actually isn't moving. So in this image, just to give you guys um, an example, this is actually a straight line. So I've been creative and moving, and, and moving around and getting off my horse, walking around, I've actually made it turn to a diagonal. And the, the subjects enter the image, but then they give a look of leaving the image. Using the, your surroundings, when I'm, when I'm running around on the image and I'm, and I'm taking pictures and it doesn't look right, why does it look right? Because the riders are so high and I'm so low. So in the back of one of the images there, you can see that there's some bigger rocks and stuff back here. Elevate yourself. Separate yourself from the situation and take a look around. Okay? So it gives us a more desirable view than if it was just a straight line and that's it. All right? So uh, at our next image here, this is a climbing image. And the reason I'm showing you guys this is just to show it doesn't matter what we're shooting. We're using our rule of thirds all the time. Every time we look through our viewfinder. As I mentioned, we see left to right. That doesn't mean that left to right is always right. Right to left, higher, lower. But like I say, this would be boring image if this guy is just sitting directly in the middle of this image. Doesn't, you know, it, it helps a lot that he's got a nice bright red jacket on. That definitely helps. I mean, uh, hunting world, you guys are camoed, so you don't really pop out as well as, as you do. But um, yeah, as you can see, it makes the image a more desirable image for our viewer. And sticking with that, here we got picture of Jason. This is my first time ever going duck hunting. I've never been duck hunting before. It's pretty cool. It was really fun, actually. I enjoyed it. Um, but it's really interesting because you don't move around a lot. You know, it, this, isn't a, this isn't a backpack hunt. So how do you make it look interesting? Filling up the corners of our image, leaving a blank space and having the ducks, I don't know if you can see them, if it's maybe too bright, flying into the center of our image makes a much more desirable image than if I'm just standing directly behind him or if he's standing over there and I'm just taking a picture and he's in the center of our photograph. Right? The corners are really important. So in an image like this, you know, we're in a marsh, these are reeds. Use, the, use what's around you, all right? I mean, I've never been to that kind of thing, as, I, as I mentioned, but watching what these guys do and you know, kind of get this area just gets matted down. And you know, you're like, well, if I duck in behind these reeds, it's gonna look a lot better. Now also, the ducks are flying and it's windy, you may not be able to see, but uh, the belt here is, 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 is blowing. It's not video. We're, and so we're trying to show some movement, but we need to freeze it as well. Ducks are flying fast, they're flapping their wings. So we need a high shutter speed. If we're just putting our camera on auto all the time, sometimes it'll work. Sometimes the camera, it'll be bright enough, the camera will read the situation and it'll freeze it. But getting away from that and wanting to shoot manual, we need to freeze a subject. Or else our ducks are gonna be blurry, and if I submit this image to Jason, he's not gonna be happy, and if it goes to an editor, he's not gonna be happy. It's just gonna be a blur in the sky, he may not even show up. So that's really important. Obviously we wanna be in great locations and we wanna be around really interesting subjects, but that doesn't always happen. You know, um, duck hunting, I say like, like being on sheep hunts, I didn't find it as interesting or as dramatic as being on a sheep hunt or being on a bear hunt. But you can make some really beautiful art, that's what we're doing. You know, we're, 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 we're making art out of a single image. And we're trying to bring a wow factor to a viewer, whether it's an editor, whether it's a friend, family member, whoever that viewer is, okay? So our next, we're gonna talk about some mistakes. So Lance showed this image earlier, this is my image, this is on an Alaska hunt, so we've got like, you know, the master guy here, Lance, we've got the man himself, Jason Harrison in the back, in the boat, and it's a pretty cool situation, right? I mean, we're, we're in a cool location, don't mess this up. But I messed it up, well, I did, but we've done something to make it like this mess up. So does anybody sort of have an idea on why this image is wrong? <laughs> That's right. That's our horizon line, which is actually our shoreline in this image. So if we look at 
and I tilted this, I mean, I shot it properly. So here's the original image. You see the difference? Does that make sense to you guys? Horizon lines are really, really, really important. If we're in the mountains, if we're on a river, our background, we forget about it because something's so exciting in front of us. And you've got this amazing location, you've got these guys that are cool and smashing through the water, and you forget about the background. So how do we fix that? Well, sometimes it's as simple as just giving your camera a quick tilt. Now, you can't do that if you're in the mountains and you have a bunch of jagged peaks. That won't work. Um, so we move. You as the photographer move. A lot of times, like I said, I separate myself from the situation and I have to move around them. I'll ask them, you know, once in a while to, you know, you have to walk this way, you know, to, to, to get the proper shot. But a lot of times that's not possible. They're hunkered down somewhere, they're glassing, or they're on a stock and I crawl away because I want to use a different perspective. My, lamp, my, my horizon line's not straight. There's a tree in the way. Something is messing up my image. So this image is kind of, um, why this image works with our, with our person so close is our depth of field. So depth of field is a really important part of taking better pictures. You don't need to have the fanciest gear. You don't need to be, you know, you necessarily don't have to want to work in the industry. But I mean, taking appealing images, filling the screen, fill your screen with the story. The story is not the background, but we need to not screw it up and we need to get it straight. This is the story of Lance pulling this through the freezing water and his partner in the back paddling the boat. Getting it, to, getting it into position. So some more images that we don't like. So I was just recently, I flew in here from Mexico to Guadalajara, I was on a surf trip and for 10 days. And I brought along some QU gear, we were doing some lifestyle stuff. So we got this cool old Bronco and unfortunately the surfing didn't work out. And we got you know, our, our, our bags in the back and we're driving down, down the road but is it, the image is wrong. It's not a good image. And we tried to set up our rule of thirds. We tried to go through the process of you know, making a cool image, but it didn't work. Does anybody have any suggestions on why or why, why they don't like this image? Sorry? No? OK. Well, the reason why we don't like this image is because it's boring. This car looks like it's pulled over at the side of the road. You know, like, it doesn't even look like we're even moving. With a, with a small adjustment of our shutter speed, now we're using movement and repositioning our model. Our bags draw our eye to our model, and with a slower shutter speed, now we're able to give a view of movement, which makes it look like we're moving and we're not shooting video. So, I don't know how it looks, maybe it's bright in here to you guys, but it's a much more desirable image. It's the exact same, it's taken 10 seconds later from this. You don't have to like the image, you just have to understand that that makes a better image. Does that make sense? Shutter speed, composition are key elements to what we want to do when we're, when we're taking photography. I want to get a little bit into depth of field. Jason and Brendan, after coming out of Bonnet Plume, and just spending know, five, six hours walking down a river to get out. So we know we're getting out. So we have a choice of side sloping across a hill that we already came across, which was not fun and it's full of bugs, or taking the opportunity to go down a canyon, which is as if nobody's been down it before, but maybe it'll get it out or maybe it'll cliff us out. But it's gonna be a five, six hour grind and we know that it's gonna trash us. So I was really happy that we chose this as a photographer. I got to go with them, right? But I know that the images are going to be pretty awesome if we, make, if we can get out of there. So that's what your feet look like after being five, six hours in a glacier river. They finished it. It's, it's set up, but it's pretty natural. They're sitting there like that, and I've removed myself from the situation again. One of the guys having a beer, and it's just a couple bros. I asked them to, you know, to bang hands, and you're going to have to do that. But the depth of field showing our feet and how clear they are fading back. Shooting at 5.6, I don't know how many of you guys are shooting with SLR cameras. 
5.6 is about as low as I like to go. You know, all these high-end cameras with their 2.8s and 1.2s and all that, that's, that's great. That doesn't work in documentary-style field photography. I'm not taking a picture of his toe. I'm taking a picture of two sets of, of feet. There's four, there's, there's four feet here. I need to get them all in focus. 5.6, taking a portrait of your friend, you like, you like that, back, that, that blurred background look, don't go any lower than 5.6. If you do, what's going to happen is if, you, is if you blow up an image, you're going to find that maybe one eye is sharp, the nose is sharp, but the rest of it's not. 5.6 will give you a really good starting point uh, for the aperture of having whatever is whatever's in front, focus, and then as it fades back. Okay. Landscape. Showing perspective of where your subject is. So this is just taken up in Alaska, just recently. And we got Jason up here on the rocks. And if I just zoom in on him, or if I just use a wide angle lens and I walk up to Jason, and there's this big, beautiful vista in front of me, a wide angle lens is gonna make the background so tiny that it's just not gonna look proper. Even if we use our, our, our rule of thirds and we're trying to fill up our corners or our sky, whatever, with what's going on, it's not going to look desirable. Telephoto lenses are key. It's um, separating yourself once again and using a vantage point for you as the storyteller, as a documenter, and, you, and actually pulling in the subject. That pulls in our backgrounds, it pulls in the ocean, and it gives us a better surrounding. So we're going to talk a little bit about gear that I bring on my trips. Um, when I'm on a backpack hunt, I don't have a lot of options. So whatever, 10 days, 12 days being in the bush, I work on a skeleton system. I got a wide angle lens. This one here is 11 to 24. I'll go as well, I even go as high as 16 to 35. That's a decision I make at home before I go on the trip and where I'm going. What's the landscape like? Doing the research on home. Where am I going? A lot of times you know the outfit you're going with and you know what animal you're going to shoot, but what's the landscape like? Is it going to be bushy? Is it going to be marshy? Is it going to be open? Is it going to be closed? That decides, that's the deciding factor of I'm going to bring a 16 to 35 wide angle lens or an 11 to 24. The 11 to 24 is wider, but it also has more of a chance of distorting images if you get close. Wide angle lenses will distort images. If I take a picture and I'm this far away from a subject, it's not going to look good. The person's not going to be happy. Don't take pictures of women like this because it makes their faces really wide and you're going to get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> 70 to 200 as my telephoto lens or 1 to 400. What am I going to bring? I'm only bringing two. I've tried to bring three. I've tried to bring four. It sucks. These guys are pros. They're fast. Whether they're skiers, whether they're climbers, you got to go with two options, I find best. One wide angle, one telephoto. That gives me, there's a massive range in there that's missing in focal length. So I, as the photographer, as a documenter, have to decide where I'm going to be. And I gotta say, separating yourself and thinking about the image process of taking images and not just spraying and praying and hoping that you get an image, it doesn't work. All right. When we're in the field, using cards. So these are full-size sensor cards. These are waterproof packets. They are the best thing on the planet. I could take this and I could throw it in a bucket of water right here and none of my images are gonna get wrecked. I don't bring a lot of cards and I don't shoot on big cards. These are 32 gig cards. Don't shoot on big cards. It's one of the biggest mistakes I've seen made in the industry and I've made it myself. Unless you're shooting video. These 64 gig cards, these 100 gig plus cards, if everything is on that card and you go for a swim, everything is ruined. The trip is ruined. And you have to go back and explain to somebody why you don't have any images. Because you put them all on one card. It doesn't work. I'll bring up to eight cards, 32 gig cards on this body. This is a 5DS, so the body shoots really big um, for, for, the sensor's really big for, for big images, for blowing up, for billboards, that sort of thing. If you're not going to be shooting, and so I, I get about 
for, with a 150 meg file, I can get about 300 images on one card. That's a lot of images, 300 images. Um, and if we're going through the thought process of starting and thinking to ourselves, what am I going to create today? What's the lighting like? Where am I going to be working? Where do I want my subject to be? I'm not going to take this picture today, right now because the light's blowing out. Don't waste your time doing it. You know you're going to be back there later on that evening, or, you're going to, or it's, it's around camp. Go back and shoot it when you know you got good light. If it's light and you're like, if this, this image is just going to be crap anyways, don't shoot it. Don't waste your card. And don't waste your batteries because you, can't, you, you just don't have an unlimited supply of battery power. You have a certain amount of battery power and you got to stick within that range because if it's, it's day five and you're out of power, you're in a lot of trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. There's no more images to take and then I want to go home. So that's about cards. Shooting, yeah, I say nothing bigger, no, nothing bigger than a 32 gig card. When the weather gets bad, that's a good thing. We're dry, we're wearing Kuyu gear. How do we keep shooting? This is the best invention in the world. You get like two of these things for like eight bucks. I've used other um, lens covers that attach to the specific lens that you have on the camera. Those don't work when you want to change a lens. This, it's like a big condom. Pops off your eyepiece off the back, it slides on, and you can interchange the lens, and it's plastic, you can see right through it. Okay, so you're able to work all your functions. If your lens gets wet, it's not that big of a deal. If the connection between the camera and the lens gets wet, you're gonna have a problem. And you may not have a problem right away, depending on how wet it is, but I went for a swim with Brendan up in Alaska like two years ago, and my camera was submerged for three seconds, didn't work at all. It was done. I was like, well, I don't want to go camping for the next week and I need new, and I need new gear, so I, I had to leave the trip. Um, so yeah, these things, I mean, you can find them online and it is called the camera condom. Um, look at them, yeah, these are two for eight bucks. Yeah, they rip, they tear, whatever, just, just buy three or four of them. Two of them will last me a trip, no problem. Usually I leave it on my camera the whole time, even if it's sunny. The only time I ever take it off is if we're glassing or if we're stalking, and those guys just say, hey, it's, you're making too much noise. But if it's pouring rain, I can shoot the whole time. And I've been in some of the worst storms, whatever, throughout, in the Himalayas, Scotland, shooting climbing, skiing, same thing. Everyone's putting their camera away, and I'm able to shoot, literally because of this plastic bag. And uh, that brings me to another point here that I wanted to talk about. What was that? I can't remember. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Sorry? With, it, with this is on? Camera strap stays on the same. Just pop off that. Whatever, that goes around my neck. We have to pop off the eyepiece. And that just slips right on, the, the string end goes on the section so we can tighten it around our lens. That slips back on, put the plastic over the eye cover, pop the lens cap back on, and it's just like that. With the lens hood on here, water is not a problem. Even around salt water, so when we're in a boat and we're shooting surfing, it's a lot of salt water, there's a lot of spray. You don't want your camera susceptible to that for very long. And you can't go home and wash your camera off with clean water like you can with your tripod. This is the best system that, that, I've, that, that I've ever seen. And there's a lot of them out there and you can see them and it's like 200 bucks for a cover. But it only fits one lens. You can't change lenses on it. And they're a pain. And I can change a, a 400, a 600 mil lens will work in that. That just pops right over there. Yeah. Our camera bags, sorry guys, I don't have my camera bag with me here. I came from a, separate, from a separate trip and there was no room. We're not using our cameras if they're not accessible. My camera's not my backpack, it sits on my chest. I have a chest bag, a chest harness, and I bring, my, I make sure that my lens fits both my, my telephoto and my wide angle both fit in it. And then the other lens just goes in a bag, just in a lens bag, hangs off my side. If I have to tell you to stop, so I can get my camera out to take a picture, 
it's not going to work. And they're like, no, we're on a stock. Like, we, we, we got to move. Can you repeat that for me? No. So when it's in my chest, a big problem with this is I can't see my feet. Practice with it at home. Walk around. Walk around on some, on some, on some steep ground because you won't be able to see your feet. So when you are trying to make a foot placement, if you're in a steep area, you can't see that foot. You're always seeing one step ahead. And the more you wear it, the better you get. And it's really important, the fact that if you want to take good pictures, your camera has got to be out. It has to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the question was, how many batteries do I take in five days? Um, five days, I take two, two, three batteries. Yeah, like a 14-day trip, six batteries. And I, just because I'm not shooting enough, and my batteries are always on my body. Uh, I've always keep them as close to myself as I possibly can, but in, in, in cold weather. Uh, that's really important. Your batteries will die really quick, especially if you're shooting video. Video eats up a lot more battery, and if you don't have your batteries on you, if they're, if they're in your pack, they're going to die. You're going to pull them out and they're going to die. Keep them as close to your body as possible. Keep them in all your, all your separate pockets in Ziploc bags. Not a problem. Sleep with them. Sleep with your batteries. Even in the summertime, they can drop down cold enough that it just starts taking the power away from your battery. And you don't want that to happen. Yep. No, no, I'm not. I'm always, I'm, uh, uh, in, in situations, you know, where you're on a stock and usually I'm not right with them. So I, so I, I want to shoot telephoto, I want to pull it in. I might, when your camera's there, you're ready. He's got to get his gun off. By the time he's got his gun off, your zipper's open. And like I say, if you have to stop and pull your camera out of your backpack, you're going to miss it. And that's where people say, oh, you, you know, do, do, do you mic up? You won't have to, as long as you're in that situation. Uh, anybody else have any questions that they want to talk about? Yeah. As the subject, or you know, in your case here, um, is there anything that uh, they can do other than acting as natural as possible that can help ensure a good shot or a good scene or tell a good story? Yeah, you, you know what? Sometimes I get so unnatural. Right, so the question is, is, is trying to sort of can communicate with them to, yeah, to communicate with them to be in, in the proper position to take the photograph. You, it's a blank canvas. If you're going to be walking back from them, or if you're going to hang back, then I'll tell my subject, like I say, whether they're skiing, climbing, whatever it is, I need you over here. Can you, can you do that? I mean, even if they want to get to here, can you walk around this ridge for me and get up here? Because I want to shoot this way, actually. If they can't do it, they can't do it. Most times, I'd say eight times out of ten, they'll do it. You know, like I said, you may have to move, but like I say, a lot of times you've got to remove yourself, first of all, from the situation. And if you do, and you can look around and then, and then just tell somebody what you want. Um, the only reason that it, it's never happened is if that they wouldn't do something is if they're on a stock or if it's danger. Take it from the reverse, though, being the subject. Yep. The yep. Yeah, body position is a huge, huge factor in, uh, in, in, in taking images. Um, with your subject is, if their clothes are sloppy, it's, it's going to look terrible in the image. If they're hunched over, it's going to look terrible in images. If their zippers on their pack, their straps aren't done up, it looks like crap. It, I know it's hot, you know, like, can you do your vents up for me for five minutes? Can you make sure that all your straps are tucked in, that, that, they're, that they're clean? Clean, we want clean, we want clean. Your gun's sort of drooping right now. Tighten it up. That's uh, what I've found to be the best. And you know what, it doesn't always work. I mean, sometimes I've, I've put together an image, you know, in my head, and I've tried and tried, and I don't get it. But I mean, having people hike properly, not looking like robots, and, and, and over time, it just gets easier and easier. But telling your subject, too, that doesn't look right. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't look good. You look like you're walking like a robot. Relax. You know? Um, really helps. And just be honest. Be honest. You're trying to come home with an image. These guys all want to come home with trophy pictures of their animal. They want to come home with great images. That's your job. As the photographer, that's your job. And if, and if you don't do it, 
you're not going to get hired or you're not going to get welcomed back on, on, the, on the next adventure. And we want to go on these adventures because they're really fun. And I'm not good at anything else. I didn't do well in school. <laughs> you know, so I was a lot better being out here. And, and, and being creative is the first step. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, no, I bring, depending on where I'm going, so depending on where I'm going, is, it, it, it delegates what camera gear I bring and what I'm bringing to camp. Okay? My camera gear, when I leave home, I do have a camera bag I bring because I got my computer and I'll have hard drives in there and um, you know, other photography stuff that, I, that I'm gonna, gonna, gonna edit with. But once I get into camp, it goes into my chest harness and it goes into my lens bag, into the bags, and that's it. I, I, I don't touch any of that other, that other backpack gear. Again, my backpack, like it's just an old crappy backpack uh, that I've used for a lot of years. I'll pull it out there for you so you can see it. But the only reason I use that is just to bring external drives and, 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 and computer equipment. It carries horribly. You don't want to carry that bag. That's terrible. Yeah, Jay. In relation to trophy photos, once these hunters have shot an animal, what are some tips that you get to get better trophy photos of the animal? Okay. All right. So the question is, is taking better trophy photos? Long lens. I, most times, even, you know, moving the animal is key looking for a location that is desirable. You shoot your subject, he's dead, you're laying there, and a lot of people will photograph the animal right there. If there's a, a mountain in our, off to our left or off to our right, or a creek or a stream or whatever, it's gonna make, be a lot better if we can use that as a backdrop. Getting some help, dragging the animal, and using a telephoto lens. It pulls in our background, and then we wanna shoot no less than f8 if we're shooting with uh with uh, with, with slr cameras it's going to make our image a lot more desirable a lot of times people ask me wow like that mountain's right behind you or right behind brendan whenever when, when he when he shot that like that looks that looks great you're like well we moved it and i shot with a telephoto lens if i shoot with a wide angle lens it looks terrible it makes the animal look like he's this big and the person's head just sticking up behind him and it's this big and that's not very desirable, and people aren't very, pr aren't very proud to show those images. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for if you're just getting into photography and you want some recommendations, if it's an SLR camera, in the digital world, a lot of cameras are great. People, you know, like I shoot Canon. I, I, I shot Canon for years, even before digital. I learned how to shoot film. Canon and Nikon, I always kind of compare it Chevy and Ford. You know, there's a lot of other great cameras out there. You know, Pentax, I mean, they had one of those. That was a great camera. Nowadays, if you're going to shoot digital, get a full frame body. They're a little bit more. Unless you're shooting a far away subject and you need a fast shutter speed such as surfing or skiing, get a full frame body. If you put a 16 to 35 lens on your camera and it's not a full frame body, now all of a sudden it's like a 21 mil lens. You just spent $2,000 on a lens that you're not getting what you wanted out of it. Those lenses or those bodies, the, 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 the cropped bodies, they're great, but they're great from far away and they're a lot faster. Like I say, if you're shooting skiing or, or climbing, you need to free somebody, but we're not. We're shooting general life, you know, um, we want, we, you know, and we're shooting hunting, or we're shooting you know, climbing, or whatever our sport is, or whatever it is, horse racing, whatever it is that you're doing, you wanna buy a lens and you wanna, you wanna have that lens for what it's designed to do. There's no point in buying a wide angle lens and paying money for it and it not working out.
Uh, just got a couple minutes left. Yeah, sure. Good question. How many hours do I spend editing? Not long. That's one thing. That's why I don't shoot a lot. I've done it before, and it's terrible. Um, after, say, you know, a 14-day hunt, I've got everything edited in under a week. And I, I'll shoot. People come back and they're like, yeah, I shot 5,000 images. I shot under 1,000. Because I'm thinking about everything that I want to do. When, you, when I came from the, the film world, and you, know, you had your 36 exposure, you didn't have the option of shooting 2,000 photographs, 3,000 photographs. You don't want to do that. Editing's boring, it's long, it's tedious, and it's not fun. Yeah, so yeah, shoot it, don't, just set up your shot and don't shoot. Editing's no fun. Yes? Do you have a goal about how many images you want to get a day? No, no, I, I, let, I let the day unfold. Some days I've shot 200 images, other days I've shot five. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Uh, and you're trying to stop motion or show motion or yep. Yep. Do you run full manual all the time? Yeah. Yeah, no, yep. no, I run full manual all the time whenever I'm choosing my subject and uh, if, if, if speed, whatever. Uh, if, if, I, if, if a hunter's moving or if a skier's, a skier's moving, with a skier, you can, you can make a skier look, or look solid in focus and the background be blurred with like 80th of a second. You don't have to go down to 15th of a second or something like that and just pan along with that, with that subject and your image should be clean. Yeah. Yes? When you're trying to separate yourself from your subject, yep. uh, have you ever blown the stock? <laughs> no, so the question was, have I ever blown the stock when I'm trying to separate myself? I haven't yet. Um, that's a good thing. You, you know what, the, the Jason and the guides, they're great. They usually let me know ahead of time. They're like, they'll just like, get down. Shut up, don't move, and um, I do it on hold. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, so the question is when, I, when, I'm, when I'm editing, what programs should I use? I use both Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, I used Aperture before Lightroom came out, and the only reason I was using it was just because uh, it was great to see all my images together. And, and literally, I used Lightroom to, to download all my images into so I can delete the ones that I don't want to, make slight adjustments, but most of my adjustments are all, all made in Photoshop. And I don't know Photoshop that well. If you ask me to make a gray sky blue, I don't know how to do it. I'm, I'm keeping it really, really simple for what I need to do. I think, uh, are we good? I think we're out of time, guys. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.